Hello and welcome. Um, I'm Paul Lewis. I'm the president of the Architecture League. And uh, I, I'm very pleased everyone is here for this current work lecture with Lionel uh, Defleyer of, uh, of Rotor. This event is, uh, is sponsored in part by public funds from the New York State Council on the Arts with the support of the New York State Legislature. Um, and the Architecture League additionally thanks its members uh, whose support helps make this and other programs possible. And also thanks to our program partner, uh, the Irwin S. Channing School of Architecture at the Cooper Union. And mostly thanks to Ann Rieselbach, uh, uh, the League's Program Director, and Katerina Flaxman, the League's Program Manager, for curating and producing the current work uh, series, and to Mariana Mogol uh, Mogolovich, um, Mogolevich, sorry, I, I, my apologies for, to Mariana, uh, the Editor-in-Chief of Urban Omnibus for drawing our attention to the work of Rotor. Uh, so it's my, uh, my great pleasure to introduce uh, Lionel. He's the co-founder of the Brussels-based Cooperative Rotor, uh, really one of the most interesting uh, entities actively reworking the physical organization of the material environment around the issue of, uh, of reuse. And in the process, rethinking kind of fundamental questions about value in architecture and the role of design. Uh, it, it, indeed, we, we are in, uh, an, in uh, a time filled with anxiety where the converging crises of COVID, climate, racial justice, equity, all of these demand a radical rethinking of architecture, uh, critiquing, in a sense, what we take for granted. And, and this, in effect, is the basis of this current works lecture series. So relative to the global uh, ecological crisis, certain tactics in, in a sense should be reframing uh, what we do. We should be building smaller, not bit bigger, if at all. Uh, we should be building mostly out of plants with biomaterials and perhaps most important, we should be reusing things. Hence uh, the frequently made statement and uh, an existing building is the most sustainable building. So Rotor for over 15 years has uh, kind of uh, dove deeply into the pragmatic issues of the circular economy. Uh, and in so doing, they conceptually rethink the agency of the designer, its position in the flows of materials, and in the process challenge basic assumption about what a building is, its status in history, and also in culture. And suffice, uh, suffice to say there are complex ripple effects in Rotor's work. Uh, and it should come in a sense as no surprise that uh, Lionel and Rotor work in many different arenas. They work as uh, designers, uh, work as design assists, uh, working in a sense inventively uh, to enable material reuse by almost any means necessary. Uh, they work through publications. They're the authors of a, uh, of a reference textbook on building uh, component reuse. They work through exhibitions, uh, the Oslo Triennial in particular, uh, Behind the Green Door, a critical look at sustainable architecture through 600 objects. Um, they work through research, which is central to Ro uh, Rotor's projects uh, on circularity and material economy, uh, with Rotor uh, deconstruction and consulting, pioneering new methods in the field of salvage building components, uh, and Opalis, uh, which started about 10 years ago, an online guide uh, that lists uh, resellers and service providers. Um, as well, uh, Lionel uh, works through uh, uh, the form of education. And he's taught at UC Berkeley, TU Delft, Columbia University, and most recently, London's AA School. So please welcome uh, Lionel uh, to the current, current work lecture. Hello. <clears throat> I think my camera is connecting. Uh, can you hear me well in the meanwhile? Yes. Okay. Well, thank you so much, Paul. And um, thanks to the Architectural League of New York for uh, inviting me. It's, um, it's a real pleasure to be here. Um, I still see that my camera is connecting. I hope this is not going to take too much time. I will already start sharing my screen uh, and I hope that works. Please let me know. We can, we can see you, Lionel. Oh, you, okay, you can see me, perfect. All right, so <clears throat> um, 
Yeah, the title of this lecture is Reverse Architecture. Um, I hope it, it will become clear in, in what sense uh, the architecture that we are producing is in, in some way um, in reverse in, uh, in comparison well, to what is practic uh, usually practiced. I will start my presentation with, um, let's say, uh, a little introduction on a more personal note, I would say. Um, then I will talk about the, the evolution of Rotor and what we do today. Uh, and I will end with the presentation of two uh, specific design projects. Um, so that gives you an idea of how this lecture will unfold. So first, on a very personal note, um, where am I coming from? Um, this is, um, let's say, a view of <clears throat> the university um, library of the this, uh, University of Ghent, where I studied at, uh, let's say, the, the architecture department of the Applied Sciences faculty. So this is, uh, let's say, uh, in the very um, typical polytechnic uh, tradition, I've been trained in approaching architecture as a science almost. Um, and when it comes to materiality, let's say concrete was completely uh, central uh, to, let's say, um, and, and was washing almost everything else away. Um, the building that you saw, like the, the, the university library building, was designed by Henri van der Velde, um, whom you probably know. But in collaboration with this man, Gustave Magnel, he's um, a real pioneer in, in advanced, um, let's say, reinforced concrete structures. He was uh, he co-designed the, the tower that you saw, which is like a gigantic silo for books. Um, but he also founded and directed the laboratory for reinforced concrete construction at Ghent University, a laboratory that now is called the Magnel Laboratory, where, uh, let's say, uh, reinforced beams are, are being studied. It's, it's like the, the quintessence of the, the scientific approach applied to materials, um, a material that is completely, let's say, determined by uh, um, its design, by the quantity of steel uh, you put in it, by the, the composition of the, the cement and, and, uh, and the aggregates that are uh, um, introduced in it. But for the rest, uh, is is almost exclusively numbers. Um, Gustave Maniel was the man who designed this bridge, which is the, the first structure in pre-stressed concrete in the, the US. Um, probably not so such a famous bridge, but uh, um, gives you an idea of the kind of uh, let's say prestige he had in 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 that in the city of Ghent. At my university, he still has. Now, <clears throat> I think maybe in reaction to all that, uh, when I did my PhD in in architecture theory and history, I decided to focus on on some other uh, topics and. Uh, so let's say this is uh, the cover of my PhD on, on uh, your left hand side. Um, so I was working on a philosopher of uh, the, the 16th century court of uh, Cosimo de' Medici, the Grand Duke de' Medici. Um, I, I won't go too much into details, but what was of interest to me and in, in particular were the uh, theories about the origination of form um in the context of art and architecture uh and and uh, parallels you have uh, between biological origination of forms and and uh, artificial originations so the the, um, the detail that you see on the cover is uh, is actually coming from this uh, amazing grotta degli animali in the in the a grotto in the garden of the villa di castello in tuscany um, it's it's a typical work of the the later 16th century, um, and it it represents also that kind of fascination for the origination of amazing forms, such as the shape of animals, but also of uh, um, mollusks and and uh, uh, shells and and the like. Now, <clears throat> let's say obviously I spent a lot of time in in uh, in Tuscany in general and in Florence in particular. And there's one contrast that always fascinated me is that between uh, those two, let's say, poles of the same um, funerary complex, uh, 
which is uh, the, the San Lorenzo church in Florence, which, uh, um, well, it's famously built by Brunelleschi, but was uh, who has always been built with uh, Medici money. So that, uh, let's say, the Medici family was uh, uh, the their original palazzo was uh, located nearby, and uh, most uh, uh, prominent family members have uh, their tomb uh, within the complex of the the, the church. Um, so on the one hand, you have the the, the Sagrestia Nova, which was a uh, Michelangelo's first venture into architecture in the, uh, let's say, um, the early 16th century, which I, I, I won't describe you because you know it, but it's, it's, uh, it's mostly uh, white Carrara marble. On the other hand, by the, the later uh, 16th century and early um, 17th century, you have that uh, outcrop um, in the axis of the, the, the church, which is the Cappella dei Principi, um, where, as you see, almost all ornamentation is based upon colored marbles. So it's, uh, it's a combination of uh, precious marble and semi-precious stones that are composing complicated intarsia in the floor, for instance. Um, you have to remember, uh, obviously, that uh, in the 16th century, just like uh, throughout um, antiquity and the Middle Ages, a, a floor like that was polished patiently by, um, let's say, spreading some fine sand on the floor and then having a very heavy stone that is uh, pulled on both sides by two people. And they pull uh, very patiently for days and days until that floor is perfectly sanded and, uh, and uh, reveals the, the full depth of color of the, the marbles that appear in it. And it's also that origination process of a form. In this case, it's it's the veins of the marble that appear in these uh, amazing structures that uh, fascinated me. And it brought me after my uh, PhD. I don't know if everybody who's doing a PhD experiences that, but I had it. I, 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 when I stopped, finished the, the PhD, I, I needed to turn to something very, very concrete, very distant from... Um, from writing, and uh, I took some lessons in terrazzo floor making at uh, um, in Venice in the the bottega of uh, uh, an artisan. It's um, let's say <clears throat> Mr. Covato, who was uh, descending from uh, many generations up to the 16th, 17th century of artisans who have always been making uh, typical uh, terrazzo floors. So while I was, I was uh, let's say, a, a kind of an intern in the firm uh, back in 2005, I was uh, following the day-to-day -day operations and uh, accompanying the, uh, the workers uh, on their boat trips to the, the different palazzi where uh, new terrazzo floors were being laid. Now, I was amazed to discover when I was, uh, when I was there that almost all... Um, personnel involved or uh, the artisans involved in making uh, terrazzo floors, uh, be it in the Middle Ages or still today, are uh, all uh, originating from the same region, which is uh, the Friuli region. It's about uh, 100 kilometers from Venice. Here you see it on, on, on the map on, on the top left. Um, and the Friuli is the region around uh, uh, the stream called Tagliamento which is coming from the Alps and, and then uh, um, flowing to the Adriatic Sea. And here on the picture, you see a, a winter view of the Tagliamento. Um, and actually, the, 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 that stream is, is carrying multicolored marbles from the Alps and bringing them to the sea. And it's, uh, they're spread out in, in this uh, amazing landscape, uh, which is the, the dry bedding in, in the winter of uh, the river. Now, it's being said that uh, villagers living close by the Tagliamento, when they had to lay a floor or to make a floor, they just went to the river, took a bucket, and brought back the bucket of aggregates they could just uh, um, pick up there in that river bedding. Then they brought it to, uh, to their homes, they mixed it with some, some lime, and then they made these amazing floors, which are naturally multicolored. Um, now, this is, has become like a, um, uh, let's say, 
a, a stock floor for uh, the city of uh, Venice. It's it's called uh, Arlecchino, um, and it's uh, well, let's say when you see the aggregate here, you see also the the the, the joints that are um, let's say very variegated, and that is typical of a lime-based terrazzo. So um, it must be said that up until the the late 19th century, early 20th century, all terrazzo floors were made of lime. What is amazing about that is that you can easily restore it. So this is a, a restoration artisan who is trying to replicate exactly the kind of composition of uh, an, an antique floor. And uh, and he's going to be able to do it in, in such a way that you, you will barely notice the distinction between the, the original and the replicate floor. Um, so it's it's something uh, uh, quite amazing these uh, the, these lime based um, lime based terrazzo floors. Now, when I got back from there, I started myself to to make a few. I started a career, a short career, I must say, as an artisan. I made a few uh, terrazzo floors myself. Now, I was I was uh, doomed, or or let's say uh, I was forced to do these with cement, which will give something completely else and has absolutely not the kind of plasticity that you have with um, um, lime-based terrazzo floors. So here, the cement has been mixed with um, let's uh, with pigments, of course, uh, to to have the the brownish red colors. But the marble itself is is uh, Belgian marble. Uh, we have a pretty famous uh, reddish. Belgian marble, the reds and the blacks are, 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 are stock marbles. Now, <clears throat> um, just to, to give you an idea of what I was doing in 2005, and, and the period was right thereafter, but 2005 is also the period that I met the, the guys uh, from Rotor, or with whom we started Rotor, uh, Tristan Bonifer and Martin Chile. Uh, so it, it, in the beginning, it was a, a venture with three people, and then uh, we the, the team gradually grew. Now, what Roto was was uh, uh, initially uh, interested in were waste materials from uh, industrial production. So um, it's it's. Uh, I hope you you will be able to see the connection with the the, the marble stuff I was explaining before, but it's uh, we were looking at these elements and trying to see whether there was a potential for uh, use in, in secondary sectors. So these are waste uh, streams that are steady in the sense that, uh, uh, for instance, the cones you see on your left hand side are a, um, a byproduct of the, 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 the production of rubber boots. So this is a, a poem of uh, polyurethane foam. So when they inject the polyurethane in the molds to create the, the rubber boots, um, there's always an excess of, of uh, material that, that drips out of, uh, of, of the whole injection machine. And after a while, it creates these cones. Uh, this is a, a material that cannot be recycled. You, you cannot melt polyurethane. So you have to destroy it in the end. And, and uh, our research was looking at these production processes, looking at the, the, those steady streams of uh, waste material and trying within the, the spirit of, uh, I would say, uh, industrial ecology, trying to look at whether uh, in the context of architecture uh, of or design, these elements could, could have a meaning. Um, the, on your left-hand side is a, a, a color transition of uh, the production of uh, waste liner bags. Now, very quickly, our interest shifted um, to maybe a, a slightly more familiar terrain, which is uh, instead of looking at uh, uh, the, the production of industrial waste at large, we started to look at uh, industrial waste in the context of uh, the building industry, because we, we were amazed to see how wasteful the building industry was and how uh, there was a paradox in Belgium in the sense that uh, there, was, there was a kind of huge pride from uh, especially from public authorities in the fact that the, a huge amount of uh, uh, building and demolition debris is recycled and, uh, and realizing practice what that meant. In practice, it means that uh, materials that are potentially uh, worth hundreds of euros a ton 
like these bricks or the ceramics or, or natural stone are just crushed into a kind of uh, anonymous aggregate, which is then used for the, the foundation in, in, uh, in context of road building. Um, let's say the, the amount of waste that is available now is so huge that uh, the, the market value of these uh, of that crushed aggregates has, uh, has uh, plummeted and is at about zero euro ton today. So it's, uh, it's a kind of industrially organized destruction of uh, assets and, and of uh, resource that we found slightly scandalous. Uh, what is scandalous about it is also the fact that uh, these, these amounts are increasing in, in, uh, in a dramatic way. Uh, the pyramid you see here is representing the amount of waste produced in, in, uh, in only in the tiny country of Belgium uh, in one year. So we're talking about, uh, um, well, these 20 million tons of, uh, of waste material. And that, that amount has almost doubled uh, between 2004 and 2016. So if you look here at these numbers, uh, so the bottom line is really showing the evolution between uh, the 11 million in 2004 and then uh, what you have in 2016. It's, it's an almost doubling. It's, it's not the case for every country in the EU, uh, but for Belgium, the Netherlands, it's, it's absolutely dramatic. It's, it's really a doubling. And then the question raises for what is responsible for that doubling. Um, and probably uh, the, the basic culprit is uh, the phenomenon of uh, architectural obsolescence, uh, which is the fact that buildings that are uh, barely 25, 30 years old are being raised um because for a uh, combinations of reasons they're uh, deemed unfit uh obsolete and uh so this is for instance a, a typical governmental building that has been uh, raised in, in 2019 which had probably a potential for reuse but might not even or sh should maybe not even have been built in the first place uh a typical other example is uh, the seat of the European Parliament, a notoriously ugly building uh, from, from the yeah, postmodern era, but uh, which might be raised in, uh, in a couple of years after about 25 years of existence as well. Now, the, when you look at the amounts of building and demolition debris that are coming out uh, in a city like Brussels, it's not only the fact of, uh, or not only the result of buildings being raised in their entirety, it's also the, uh, the huge and rapid turnover of uh, building interiors. And that is a topic that became of, of a special interest to us. So um, these are the interiors of, um, General Electrics, uh, or let's say they, they had been rented by General Electrics on a, a square that is the Schumann Square. It's uh, in terms of real estate value, one of the most expensive places in in, um, in Brussels. It's uh, so it's the third and fourth floor of uh, the building you see on the top left. And that is the state in which uh, the buildings were when uh, the the, uh, the company was leaving the premises. Um, so yeah as you see these are uh, the, these are interiors that have been well maintained uh, have been cleaned on a daily basis and everything is virtually in good shape but typically everything you see on the picture uh, is going to be to end up in the rubbish bin and that is standard procedure because each time they change tenants they, they will also change the the complete interiors and that is something we started to focus our attention on to uh, from, let's say, 2014-15 on. We tried to see whether it would be possible just to, um, let's say, start a dismantling operation and, uh, let's say, to, to the whole evacuation process of those elements that we deemed uh, worthy of reuse. Now, um, how shall I say, the, the, it, it's a combination of identifying those right elements, uh, finding the, the, the way to dismantle them, and then also uh, it's, it's pretty intense logistic operation. We had, uh, let's say, 
a kind of advanced uh, or accelerated course in, in all these issues when we were confronted with uh, um, on invitation with the, the project of the, the demolition of this bank. So this is the, the seat of um, the General de Bank. It was uh, formerly the biggest bank of Belgium. It was then bought up by uh, BNP Paribas, a French bank. But uh, after the banking crisis of uh, 2009 or in, in, in the, the aftermath of the crisis, um, the, the bank decided to uh, redesign their own seat completely and uh, they wanted to get rid of that old brutalist building of the late uh, 1960s, early 70s. Now, nobody was really sad about the disappearance of the brutalist building, which is really in the, the, the center of the urban fabric of Brussels. It's right next to the, the Royal Palace and the Bozar um, Art Center. But uh, uh, on the other hand, the interiors of that building were, um, let's say, notoriously beautiful and famous. They, they have been designed by a, a designer called Jules Wapps. It's probably not very known in the US, but in, in Belgium, he's uh, like uh, renowned as one of the best post-war designers. He's only working in, in uh, materials that are enduring uh, centuries. Like uh, in this case, these are the, the executive floors of that bank. It's, uh, it's, it's brass, it's bronze, it's uh, solid granite, it's um, it, tropical woods, etc. Um, and so here, uh, well, we knew that every, everything was going to end up in, in the waste bin. So the idea was to, to focus on whatever could be salvaged within the pretty short time frame and the very difficult uh, uh, conditions we had to work in. So we set up a team very quickly and we started dismantling, for instance, here, the, the walls of uh, those exec executive floor um, levels. This is Italian granite and it has been flamed on the surface. So uh, it, it, it has been, uh, let's say, treated with a plasma flame so to chip off uh, the, the surface elements so you get a very nice and beautiful texture so on the spot we organized a, a dismantling operation uh, the the basic cleaning of these uh, um, elements was done there as well so uh, on the side of the bank and then everything was palletized and prepared for uh, transportation to the, the new warehouse that we started to rent for this uh, project so that is 2014. Here you have an image of the, the bank uh, right at its opening. So the ground floor of the building was, uh, an, um, let's say, a gigantic ticketing hall. So there was a, a, a branch of the, the bank uh, or a, let's say a public branch of the bank that, that was operating there as well. And uh, the ceiling you have there is, um, well, a very sophisticated uh, system of, of uh, little metallic blades hanging from uh, from above, and it combines, uh, let's say, the, the, the function of a, a suspended ceiling and a kind of light filter. So the, um, let's say, all the, the lightning fixtures are above the, the ceiling itself in these uh, tiny metallic blades. It's nicknamed the um, mille feuille ceiling in French. And so we set up a dismantling operation for that uh, suspended ceiling. We had these cardboard made uh, on the right dimension to, to store it all. And we discovered actually that, uh, let's say, the, the, the system is very um, prone to dismantling. Um, so you can, you can flat, pack, flat pack it, um, so to speak. And then those things were, were made available for resale, but I, I will come back on, on that later on. So that's a little bit of, of, uh, of Rotor history, uh, where we come from, where we, we then ended. Much has changed between 2005 when we, uh, when we founded Rotor and today in the sense that uh, we were completely marginal back then in the days and now uh, we're not no longer in the sense that reuse as a principle, which we always advocated has been largely accepted uh, and people, even public authorities, recognize the environmental benefits of reuse, the fact that it stimulates the local economy and it preserves a form of heritage. So uh, we even have now, um, let's say, very um, 
recognized public institutions such as the Belgian Building Research Institute that help us to calculate the difference in, in environmental impact between a new um, floor tile, for instance, as you see on, on uh, the, the, the left side of the diagram. And it's equivalent in, in, the, um, in reused form. So, I mean, in this case, uh, as you see, it's like uh, even less than one sixth of the impact of, of uh, a, a new ceramic tile. Um, and obviously we, we have these calculations for many other uh, materials. We have operators that have been identified and then uh, architects are, are getting more and more familiar with that are uh, salvaging uh, uh, bricks. So they're recuperating these huge chunks of masonry, bring them to their warehouse and then they have uh, specialized workers that will uh, spend their days cleaning the, the old mortar from the bricks. Uh, they palletize them and they make them available for uh, reuse again. You have uh, young generations of architects that are working with these materials, <clears throat> such as uh, the people from, from uh, Bluff Architecten. This is already a project from 2013. It's, uh, let's say, it's a structure in solid wood. It's only the outer wall that is uh, made out of uh, savaged bricks. So now we end up in, in a situation that is slightly paradoxical in the sense that um, <laughs> On the one hand, uh, everybody embraces the principle of the circular economy and uh, you have all these documents, official documents uh, on, on, on regional, national, European level uh, that actively encourage the, the whole principle of the circular economy and, and uh, reuse in particular. But then when you look at the, the concrete numbers of the amounts of uh, building elements that are being recirculated beyond their first use were at one percent according to our calculations today and it's probably almost never been that bad uh, in the whole history of, uh, of, of building so there's a, a kind of paradox there that we're dealing with and and and, and grappling with uh, as well so i would say that that Rotor in its actual configuration is, is just setting up a whole, well, array of efforts to try and counter that reality or, or to try to, to push that number uh, to higher levels. Um, and uh, as Paul uh, indicated, uh, we do that through different channels. So uh, on the one hand, we, we are designing designers. This is the structure you will find on, on our uh, website as well. We're doing design assistance, uh, exhibitions, conferences, teaching, research, and then we have that new poll, which is which we we uh, let's say officially uh, incorporated as Rotor DC in 2016. So it's a it's a cooperative company, but everything that is explicitly commercial goes into that. It's the dismantling and and um, preparation for reuse of building components and and then their resale. Now. This is very general. Let's try and look a bit uh, more in detail at, at, uh, at what our activities we present today. But before that, the uh, presentation of those two structures, it's also two websites. Um, so uh, it's, it's really formally two different structures for the moment in the sense that we send each other invoices and stuff like that. Uh, we have different websites and a different clientele. Uh, but the people are more or less the same. This is a group picture of uh, 2018. I think we were something like 25, 28 back then. Now we're 34 officially. So it's uh, from the three people of 2005, uh, uh, the, the group grew bigger. It's, it's also important to, to uh, specify that it's uh, an explicitly multidisciplinary group in the sense that we, we have lots of architects, obviously. But we also have bioengineers, we have uh, journalists, we have uh, lawyers, etc. Because the problems we, we have to tackle are uh, very diverse, so we need diverse um, competences as well. For the moment, we have a, uh, a warehouse um, and an office space of about 5,000 square meters, uh, really in the center of Brussels, so it's uh, at 10, 10 minutes walking from the, the main central um, railway station 
Um, it's a combination of warehousing, uh, showroom, and uh, um, and shop space, and and then uh, our offices as well, where I'm sitting right now. Now, when we look at what we do, um, it it started and 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 it's still a big chunk of what we do is public policy consultancies. Now that sounds. Uh, uh yeah it sounds arid uh, and sometimes is but but it's uh it's sometimes also completely fascinating it it's trying to remember to public authorities that uh, there were days and you don't have to go back to uh too far away in which um the reuse of building components was totally incorporated in the, um let's say uh, public procedures and for instance in uh, public procurement procedures this is a poster uh, regarding the demolition of this blue tower which is a, a yeah well in, of late medieval structure it's the fortification wall of the the city of uh, antwerp by the later 19th century that uh, fortification wall had to disappear and this tower as well now uh, uh, the city on that occasion organized a sale for demolition in the sense that uh, they advertised to different demolition contractors the fact that this building became available the contractors they uh, bid it by uh, proposing a price but the price would what was what they were willing to pay to the municipality or to the city of Antwerp in exchange for uh, materials. Of course, there was a, a kind of a delay that was uh, agreed upon. Uh, I think in this case, it, it was something like three months, but, uh, but the money was flowing from the contractor to the city. Uh, and that kind of procedures is, is something we've completely forgotten. People don't even realize that it existed. Uh, what we also do is, is uh, I mean, in, in um, the book um, Paul was referring to, Deconstruction et Réemploi, unfortunately only available in French by now. Uh, we, we set out a series of, uh, let's say, uh, policy um, proposals, such as uh, the idea that whenever you take a building down, you have to put aside 5% of, of, uh, in, in weight of, of the whole building to make available for reuse. That would be a simple measure that would just uh, uh, kickstart um, the local reuse economy. It's important to say that for all these uh, recommendations or policy recommendations, we found a lot of inspiration in what is happening in the US for quite a while, in the sense that uh, the US, has a, in, in comparison with uh, the Europe, uh, has a, a pretty sophisticated reuse economy. Um, the reasons for that are, are complicated. I will not venture into this now, but uh, but we we always learn a lot when we go on on field trips to the US. So that was for for uh, public consultancies. Uh, then we also do circular consultancies. Let's say more for the private sector, um, and that has two parts. So uh, the, the the lighter version and the deeper version. Inventory making is lighter version uh, or inventory drafting. It means that we, we uh, on the invitation of a, a client, we go to a building and we, we make a list of what, what is deemed reusable of all the, the building elements that are contained in the building that, that would, for instance, be uh, destined uh, for demolition for, for yeah, multiple reasons. Now, you might say, okay, it's, it's, it's a question of can I dismantle it? But um, no, it's, it's, it's really a, a, an array of reasons that intervene. It's uh, indeed, is it easy to, dis to disassemble is a, is a core question. But then you have the question of profitability, the existence of a market or a demand, uh, homogeneity, quantity, state, uh, performance, health and safety issues, etc. So it's a, it's, it's a, it's a complex, assessment and you need obviously people with uh, very good expertise uh, but also a lot of common sense and and uh, a practical orientation what we do is that we draft a document that is a combination of these uh, uh, these kind of sheets that that um, let's say combine information about the quantities about the state about uh, uh, possible uh, reuse examples. So what you see at the, the bottom right is, uh, is a picture of how 
uh, in this case, white Carrara marble can be reused in in in, in a contemporary bathroom, for instance. And that document is 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 often extremely interesting for for the building owners in um, stimulating um, reuse solutions. Uh, they, it also contains suggestions of uh, uh, which resellers to contact who might be interested in a batch of of uh, reclaimed marble, as uh, the, the the case of this cladding here of this building. So it's. Um, um, these are often very simple documents. It doesn't take too much time to prepare them, but they're extremely valuable for, for the building owners. So that is the inventory drafting. Um, we also have design consultancies, which, which is uh, going a step further. Uh, I will explain this through one specific example. Um, sorry, I think you're not seeing the, the, the image to your left, but. I mean, it's, it doesn't mind. So th this is the seat of um, the the seat in in Belgium of the Philips company. Um, it's uh, it's a building also from the late sixties, um, finished I think in in the nineteen seventy itself. It's also located right in the middle of the the. Um, urban fabric of uh, mostly 19th century urban fabric of Brussels. This was the, how these offices looked uh, initially. Obviously, the, the interior furnishes, furnishings uh, don't exist anymore, have been completely uh, replaced since. Um, but the, let's say the real estate developer who bought the whole structure had, uh, let's say, was pretty ambitious in terms of uh, reuse uh, um, and the circular economy, economy in, in general. So um, he, he took us on board as a circular consultant, and we tried to set together a, a series of um, targets um, in terms of, uh, let's say, the amount of, of uh, structure and, and uh, uh, material that was maintained from the original building. So in this case, there is 89% of the original building in weight that is maintained on the spot. If, if you include the foundations, uh, obviously that they, they, they count for quite a lot, as you see in, in this representation. So uh, foundations are um, completely maintained underground level mostly, and then uh, the orange part is whatever is going to be extracted um, from the above ground levels. Now, once that target has been set and, and the whole uh, idea of maintaining as much as possible of the original structure has been agreed upon, uh, then obviously you, you need to focus on what's happening beyond that for the best. And that's where we, we are of assistance. Uh, and that is, it goes in, in two ways. Now, you, you have actually two main flows. You, the first flow is whatever is going out of the building uh, during the transformation. And that is where we try and look for uh, destinations for these elements that are leaving the building. So it's not because something is, is in the context of a renovation project is leaving a building that is it, it is necessarily uh, unfit or um, broken or uh, uh, completely fundamentally obsolete. And that is where we can try and find destinations for these materials. Uh, I will give you one example. Um, let's say this is a, an image of the, the chillers. So the building had two chillers, cooling uh, units, which unfortunately were not uh, um, dimensioned to the new needs of the adapted building. So they had to leave, but they were, uh, uh, they had been installed pretty recently. So um, uh, let's say they, they, uh, they were still perfectly functional. And then in, in collaboration with uh, also the firm that uh, had initially produced these chillers, we started to look for possible destinations and, and we found a destination for each each one of those two chillers. And then it became a kind of huge collaboration project of, uh, let's say, uh, systems engineers, the, the, the producers of these machines, the demolition contractors to orchestrate the, the whole transfer from one location to the other or from one location to the two others. And the uh, funny thing is that you see these these nice pictures here uh, have been taken by the demolition company, which is uh, like typically mm, not 
our best friend in in the context of the the, the whole uh, uh, building materials economy in in, uh, in Brussels, but uh, which is here uh, taken over by enthusiasm because this is a first uh, for a, um, let's say an equipment like that in Brussels, and uh, it has now become the topic of uh, of conferences and and uh, things like that. So that is for the flow of outgoing materials. Then you have the flow of ingoing materials. Uh, and there as well, we try and accompany the, the let's say, the, uh, the building owner you know, or, or um, the, the project uh, owner to incorporate as much as possible of secondhand building materials in the new project. And that is really a question of scouting uh, the, the, the reuse economy and identifying elements that, that could, uh, let's say, play the same role as a, a new building materials, uh, be ec economically competitive and, uh, and maybe uh, can be qualitatively higher than what, was, uh, uh, what is available on, on the, the, the market of new materials. Some elements, such as the, the aluminum eye profiles that were originally uh, structuring vertically the facade, um, will be retransformed um, so uh, they will be anodized again and then integrated in, in the, the interior furniture of the building but that is uh, that is then where the architects take over so th this has re been a whole triangular uh, conversation between uh, and it, it's still ongoing for the moment the project is uh, is nearly finished but uh, um, there's still still a lot of decisions have to be taken and uh, uh, as you can imagine, money issues are, are, are still uh, playing a huge role there. But uh, uh, obviously, the, the, the idea is to reach as high as possible the target in terms of uh, the amount of, of uh, salvaged or, or second-hand elements that we integrate in the project. And then, <clears throat> uh, that being said about the, let's say, the consultancies, then you have the deconstructions. Uh, that is really the job of a uh, roto deconstruction. I give you a few images of a typical demolition. This is uh, uh, the example of a building that should, according to us, absolutely not have been demolished. That was uh, demolished nonetheless. Uh, the only thing that we had time to save here was were these precious marbles um, from the, the window sills. These are marbles from Northern France and Belgium that are uh, virtually extinct today. So the, the, the quarries are, are uh, exhaust. Uh, the marble is no longer available ex uh, well, except uh, through urban mining. Um, so yeah, again, it, it's a question, it, it's mostly a logistic question. Uh, how do you palletize these? How do you bring them safely to, um, to your warehouse without damaging them? Um, and then it's important to know that the, 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 let's say, preparing elements for reuse is not only a question of uh, just safely bringing them to your warehouse. There's, uh, there's a, a, often a whole set of operations that need to be uh, done on these materials. I will illustrate it uh, through um, a material that we are uh, increasingly getting good at, uh, which are ceramic tiles. So a building from uh, the 1930s, 40s, uh, the former um, <clears throat> uh, seat of, of the, the telephone company, RTT, um, where the floors were made out of these, uh, these beautiful patterns, uh, art deco patterns in, in ceramic tiles. There we extract the, the, the tiles, we put them in these little crates that are very practical to transport, we bring them to our warehouse, they undergo first a, um, a physical treatment and then a, a chemical treatment with an organic acid. Uh, we we uh, manage to get those layers of mortar off and then they are cleaned again with the high, high uh, power water pressure and um, palletized or, or packaged and palletized. So each of these little packages is, is one square meter of tile. And then they are ready to reintegrate the project. This is like a, a modification of the, um, the original building. Um, the project is called Tivoli, and it's kind of exemplary project in uh, in Brussels. And this is how that looks. So it's it's uh, 
it allows you to reintegrate some of that original flavor of uh, of those uh, interiors in in the the new buildings now it's important to understand that uh, uh, when when you think of all the operations that need to to be done on these materials to to uh, recirculate them there is a, a a whole work of identifying describing uh putting on a website uh photographing um, just making available and making appealing um it's also a question of renovating so um this is a, a picture of our photo studio in our premises here in uh, in brussels and then uh, th these things end up on the website of uh, Roto DC. <clears throat> and that is how a material such as these uh, uh, these milfoil ceilings become available and can be integrated by any architect who, who is enthusiastic about them in their own projects. So this is just one of the examples. Uh, it's a, a space realized by Def Space, an office refurbishment in Belgium as well. We know probably of something like 20 different uh, uh, projects in which these uh, these ceiling elements have been integrated because the, the amounts of uh, we recuperated were so enormous. Now it's important to know that uh, a reuse economy only works when, when you have a, a large network of uh, operators and uh, it's it's for quite a while that we've been interested in identifying the, the the actors in that network so we're definitely not alone in doing what we do in in brussels uh, rotor deconstruction has been let's say specializing in the dismantling of office interiors so we specialize uh, uh well largely in in 20th century materials but you have a lot of other operators in uh, in Belgium who are uh, salvaging uh, building materials. Um, typically, paving stones and bricks are, are very prominent, but uh, but you have many other materials as well. And uh, so, in 2012, 2013, we started making. Uh, we started with the project uh, Opalis. Dot be it was uh, and it has become dot opalis dot eu. It's uh, it's really a digital inventory of all these uh, economic operators. So these are professional firms that are salvaging materials, but that are then preparing them for reuse, and are um, since they're expert of the material that they were reselling, they can also offer a series of guarantees and they can offer advice. And it's it's not just an anonymous database. It's it's. Uh, it's a real project partner. Uh, so we estimate that uh, for an architect or a commissioner, it's far more comfortable to walk to a professional when you need a secondhand material. So it's it's something, a principle we've always tried to, to, uh, to push. Whenever people bring up the idea of digitalization using databases of available secondhand materials, we say yes but you need a person who can take responsibility and who has the ex expertise so it's a network of artisans who are doing the the, the whole work which is extremely fine-grained of making these materials uh fit for reuse again uh so uh, it's important for people to know when when they say like okay oh what you're doing is fantastic uh, don't you want to upscale this and replicate uh, Rotor DC in uh, Barcelona or in, in Lisbon and uh, et cetera. And then we say like, okay, it is it is possible to do so, but the people of Barcelona and from Lisbon are, um, will have to take it over because the, the materials are different, the networks are different, the, the, uh, the, the available um, artisans are different. Uh, it's, it's just not something that you can replicate at wish um that's a little side note uh let's say for the moment i, I showed you the map of the extension of of uh, opalis it's uh, something that fits within a project that we call um well that is is uh, uh we we call it fcrbe it stands for facilitating the circulation of reused building elements uh and it's a european funded uh, program project uh, with a series of international collaborators. If you want to know more about this, it's easy to find. Um, obviously, uh, let's say extending Opalis is only one of the, the, 
deliverables of this uh, three-year project. Now, <clears throat> everything I mentioned in terms of the activities of, uh, of uh, Rotor and Rotor DC is mentioned here, except designing and building with reclaimed elements. And that is the point that I, I would like to um, end my presentation with. So I told you I would talk to you about two press, uh, projects. It's um, it's important to mention that, uh, I mean, these are, uh, I took some time to talk about our architectural work um, for this presentation to, to the architectural league. But uh, it's important to mention that Rotor is not registered as an uh, architectural office in Belgium. Um, it's something that we assumed ever from the beginning. We know that uh, we have lots of extremely competent colleagues that are doing the job of architecture really well so we don't want to enter in competition with them and so we we uh, we are not uh, members of the order of architects uh, in belgium for instance and uh, whenever we need um let's say to uh, whenever a client needs uh, uh, the typical services of architects and we we have to take on board uh, a partner for doing this so the project i will show is like the, the closest we come to architecture but it's uh, um it's, it's uh, sometimes often more related to interior architecture. The, the first project is a project for the a social housing company. So in a tiny little town of Belgium. Uh, and uh, this is a view of, of the offices as we found them. Um, they wanted a, a completely new interior for their main building and then for the extension they were planning uh, at uh, the, the ground level of this uh, this tiny little house uh, close to the church of the city of Westerlo in eastern Belgium. So this is how that uh, lobby looks today. Um, so it, it, it was a transformation of, of uh, um, yeah, changing a, a place that was pretty dark, unpleasant for the visitors in something that is light, cozy and welcoming. Um, so it's, it's a project that has a double ambition. Uh, as usual in everything we design, we always want to push the, the whole idea of uh, building component reuse. On the other hand, um, we are increasingly uncomfortable with designs that are uh, too, too explicitly like uh, um, exposing their, uh, their reusedness um so the the, the kind of uh, uh yeah worn out palette like uh, wood uh, look is something where we we absolutely uh, uh feel uncomfortable with and we, we prefer to have interiors that are um just like discreetly um hiding their being reused so m most of the materials you will see here in, in the, the, the upcoming pictures are secondhand, but uh, uh, not exactly everything. For instance, in, in this case, uh, you recognize the, the, the suspended ceiling, the, um, all the oak is, uh, is secondhand. The interior furnish, uh, furniture is secondhand. It has been re-upholstered. Um, the, the tree you see here is a, is a, um, a melamine market tree, tree from the 1970s that is coming from the same bank that I showed earlier on, but it was not designed by Jules Wapps, but by another famous uh, interior designer. Um, obviously, the, the, the lighting um, is secondhand, but um, for instance, the white paneling in this case is not. Um, this is a, like a tiny side office. Um, so a social housing company has, a, let's say, the, the difficult task of making this distinction between, um, let's say, candidate tenants that will have a social house and those who will not. And sometimes it, it, it means having difficult conversations. So they needed a, a kind of intimate office, but, uh, but one where, let's say, the personnel who is having the conversations there is having direct eye contact with uh, his or her colleagues and you see that the table is just dividing the space in two so that uh, those people sitting on, on the left cannot uh, step over and grab the their um, uh, conversation partner 
but the doors in in this little office are uh, uh, 1970s doors that have been uh, uh, reintegrated in in this little office. It means that uh, uh, let's say the the whole um, oak uh, framing had to be done on um, uh, to measure in this case. By the carpenter. This is a view on the extension of that office. So it's a newly built extension uh, by the architects of W2. It's a Westrelo based um, architecture office, but uh, they they uh, really try to to design something that is uh, in accordance with uh, circular principles. So they they uh, privilege the use of solid wood in this case. Um, but all the rest, uh, all the interior uh, has been designed by us. Again, uh, all the office furniture is second hand. The, um, yeah, the, the um, let's say what you see on your right hand side, um, let's say the, the paneling and the, um, the cupboard is also um, second hand. But even the floor, and you might recognize here the, the, the granite paneling of the, the bank interior with which has been turned into a floor in this case now it was a, an extremely complicated task to do so because the thicknesses of that uh, granite were slightly different so we had to design um let's say uh, a very detailed pattern after measuring up all the components of uh, of the floor itself of the granite we had to divide the whole floor in segments that were corresponding to to the different thicknesses of uh, of the material available. But then um, uh, we we had the chance of working with a, an an amazing artisan who who uh, was extremely patient in laying out uh, the, the the granite slabs. So here another view on on the floor um, and the seating unit you see there is also uh, salvaged from the other building that I showed you the the um, Flemish government uh, building that is uh, that piece of obsolete architecture uh, but of course it has been completely reupholstered and then finally the kitchen of this uh, um, of the whole unit of the extension though, so that is also built in in the, the totally new part it's um, a, a, a reassembly and reinterpretation of a set of, uh, of furniture also by Christoph Gevers uh, the, the guy who designed the tree um, it's um, it's uh, it's blue melamine, very sturdy, combined with the uh, um, wenge, which is uh, a, a tropical wood that uh, Belgians imported from uh, the Congo in the in the 1960s and 70s in, in huge quantities. It has these amazing veins. Uh, it's extremely sturdy as well. So uh, the whole kitchen is a recombination of the, the those elements that are um, originating from uh, an old interior. Uh, office interior in Brussels, and then recombined with the uh, second-hand flooring in oak, and then uh, those vintage chairs that we found. So that gives you an idea of a, uh, um, let's say, an interior design project that we finished uh, in 2019. Now, the second project I want to talk about is uh, is a project that is still ongoing for the moment. It's uh, it's not finished yet. Um, even if it will be very soon, so it's due to open um, in uh, early June. Um, so th there's not much time left for this. Uh, it's located in the city of Ostend, uh, which is uh, yeah, the equivalent of uh, Brussels by the sea. It was once uh, probably one of the most beautiful cities in, in, uh, in Belgium, kind of uh, art deco, uh, uh, metropolis uh, on the beach um, but then it was very oh, art deco art nouveau i mean um, metropolis on the beach but then it was heavily damaged uh, during world war one and world war two the image you see here is right after the second world war um, the casino that was standing at the very center of the city has been uh, bombed completely and uh, was replaced by the germans by a bunker um, so obviously, what what happens is uh, in the 1940s, the whole uh, the whole city will be rebuilt, and then it becomes a kind of explosion of uh, modernist architecture, uh, not always of uh, the best taste. Now, Ostend is also famously the city, uh, the native city of uh, James Ensor, 
whose uh, self-portrait from uh, 1883 you see on your right hand side. And um, it, it, uh, the Museum of the City of Ostend has, uh, is, uh, uh, owns that portrait in its collection. And the, the commission that we received is from that uh, Museum of the City of Ostend. So what happened? Um, now, I showed you the images of the demolition of uh, uh, Ostend to, to uh, be able to introduce this building, which is, uh, uh, let's say, uh, one of the later works of Gaston Eisling, uh, one of our better uh, modernists. Um, so uh, an architect who died tragically by suicide in the city of Ostend uh, very shortly after completing this building. The commissioner was a, a cooperative company um, called SEO, so Thrift Economy Ostend. Uh, so you have to imagine it as, as uh, uh, working people coming together to be able to, um, uh, to get better pricing on the, their uh, butter, uh, their milk, their fish, but also their consumption goods. So a principle that worked really well now very ambitiously that uh, a cooperative company decides to build its um, uh, headquarters and a huge um, department store in the city of Austin uh, right after the war. Um, unfortunately for them, um, let's say things turn for the worst and then uh, they, they will uh, go bankrupt uh, if two decades later. But uh, um, let's say, let's let's look a bit more in detail to the building itself, because that's where we intervene. So you have a, a, a symmetric facade to um, like th three um, levels, the, uh, which are each of them double heights. Uh, and this is a plan of the ground floor. I don't know if you can see these well. So um, the, the the serpentine form shape you see on on the, the plan of the ground floor is is actually a, a gigantic counter so it's a department store that hesitates between uh being just an old-fashioned store with a person behind the counter and and becoming a, a real uh let's say supermarket and it just has not made the turn to the supermarket ever. that might uh, explain the fact that the, the whole cooperative went bankrupt soon after that um the the you have two monumental staircases on both sides uh, and then very tiny elevators as well the monumental staircases were meant by the architect to be, uh, to be uh, um, elevators but the, then there was no um, escalators sorry um but then there was no money to to realize that so they they, they just remain simple stairs so it's a uh, it's a combination of ambitions for grandeur and then uh, the not having exactly the money to realize the ambitions so after the the whole uh, company went bankrupt um the city owned the museum or the museum sorry they owned the building and then uh, it was decided to use the building as uh, to house the uh, the, the the city museum which was a combination between the the museum of the province but i will spare you the, those details so uh the, the the images you see here are uh, the first installation of of artworks in the early 80s um, in those spaces now what happens is that throughout the years all these uh, spaces have become cluttered with uh uh and white painted mdf and uh, and and other materials that have increasingly blocked out all the, the the kind of openness of the original architecture um, for a combination of uh, let's say fire safety reasons uh, but which which are often badly understood and then also the need of the different uh, museum curators to have as much um, exhibition surface as possible so gradually the original architecture has been covered by layers upon layer of uh, additional paneling until not much of the, the original spirit of it is uh, rem uh, remaining. Now, the, the, the museum is also undergoing for the moment a kind of constitutional crisis or uh, institutional crisis and, and COVID is no stranger to that. Uh, so at a certain point, the board of directors said like, we, we need to take action. 
we have a budget to do works in, in four years and we can either languish on for four years or uh, we can decide to um, to do something dramatic now and then uh, and then have a, a completely different approach um, uh, for for the, the the upcoming period, it was also a, pro, uh, a museum that had uh, like systematically five different uh, exhibitions going on. The, the the amount of space they have is uh, enormous, and so it was become more and more a burden to uh, to assume uh, a program for all of these. But their permanent collection is amazing, and so the idea was to simplify the building, to reopen it up. And, uh, and and to prepare it for housing the, the permanent collection for the coming four years or five years until these works happen. Um, so we were, we were invited to intervene um, in a design project that was more um, subtractive than, than additive. So we were, uh, it, it was like our brief to extract material from the whole building rather than to add a, a, an additional layer which we obviously uh, um, enthusiastically uh, welcomed as a, an invitation so th this was one of the first move um, this had been arranged uh, this part of the space it's like the back building which you've seen on, on an earlier slide um, it had been used as a kind of a, a dark room where films were presented uh, so the window was completely um, blocked we reopened that we reopened all the windows that were originally designed in, in the building uh, but uh, the, let's say they will be um, e equipped with a, a professional um, filter and and then uh, dimming curtains um, to be sure that the artworks will be prevented but the presence like the architectural presence of the windows will definitely be uh, noticeable anywhere this is a, um, a part of the second level where, um, let's say, to dimin diminish the, the amount of light that was coming in, uh, a part of the, the original will uh, had been blocked off by this wall, which we had uh, completely unbuilt through the operations. Um, and then on the, on the first floor or one of the two floors, we, we also opened up again these, uh, these beautiful staircase that had been blocked completely. So uh, they, they had been covered on, uh, on both sides until the top with, uh, with these, um, th that combination of MDF and, and uh, plasterboard. So that was, uh, was opened up to come to, to this plan, which is uh, something a bit more dynamic, uh, but still austere and dividing up the space in in, uh, in, in different sections and levels which uh, this is the the level um, so this these are the plans how they will be executed uh, this is the level on which uh, 20th century art will be exhibited the museum has a collection that starts in the late 19th century and then moves on until the 21st century um, here the most uh, post-war uh, works will be exhibited now I will focus in, in this presentation mostly on, on the, the, the other level, so the second level of the uh, museum, since the, the visitor will begin his, uh, his visit there and then uh, walk down to, um, to the ground floor. One of the first things we decided to do beyond these, uh, um, the, the, the interventions I showed you, is to uh, bring back let's say an element of the the original design that had almost never uh, worked uh, you see the the two uh, so level one level two they have these uh, balconies that are uh, stretching out on, on uh, the both sides of uh, of um, the central building on um, on the both on both edges but these had been uh, they, they were planned to be covered with a, a, a glazing gla glass partition but probably for economic reasons that glass partition was never built and it was just replaced by a brick wall. So we, uh, we obtained the, uh, the authorization to bring down that brick wall um, to, to uh, the level of a parapet like this. And so here you see the uh, dismantling operations going on. You see the line on which they will end. And the idea is to have there uh, an inclined kind of uh, uh, drawing board that um, kids will be able to use um, to, to make sketches of, uh, of the, the newly opened view uh, in the building itself. Now, that um, 
the second level was also cluttered with these little cabinets which were part of a uh, um, let's say the the architecture that the later curators had added to to the building um to be able to to create uh, little subsections in in the museum um now we could have just uh, asked to dismantle them and, and uh, throw them away and then have new elements uh, uh, brought up to to hang the works on because obviously you need you, you will still need a uh, um, hanging surface and then we decided instead to start in using these cabinets as uh, uh, let's say the, the uh, starting point for uh, the, the the newly interpreted architecture um, and that it will quickly become clear so what you see here is a, a plan that we made it it shows the the original disposition of these little cabinets so you have four of them and then we indicated in red those elements or those wall parts that could be removed and then you see the the dotted line which is indicating cuts and even the blue parts that are uh, uh, retained we cut them in different section and then we obtain these uh, L-shaped parts that we can use, <coughs> that we can literally move around in the space, and that we can move to, uh, we can use to make a, a, a new configuration of uh, uh, of the space and, and uh, of the walls on which the works could be hung. So this is a, a drawing we came to a few weeks ago, and uh, it's still moving uh, slightly. And it's uh, it's the basic uh, document for an ongoing conversation with uh, the commissioner. So the curators are now um, clustering the, the the works, which are mostly late nineteenth century works, early twentieth century works, uh, according to a, a trajectory that has been uh, dotted out or, or in in the in the space, and that it is being accompanied by the the, the let's say the directions that these uh, different um, walls are, are pointing at so it's a uh, it's a kind of uh, reorganizing these uh, the, the, the materials that were already there um, subtracting a little bit and then uh, and then starting a conversation which um, which is still going on and is now in at the phase where we brought a model a very elementary a, a typical work model of the the space we brought it to uh, the the offices of uh, the curators in the in the museum in Austin and they have these uh, replicas of the little uh, of the all the artworks that are coming on it and so there's a whole uh, the, there's the fine grained work of uh, of uh, looking at how these works are going to dialogue together and uh, uh, and what relationships are that you are creating so it's it's uh, it's very nice to be able to uh, um, participate as a, as a designer in this case to to do the work of, uh, of curating these uh, these clusters of, uh, of uh, paintings but it's also fun to see that uh, the, the the curators are also participating in in the in our work in the sense that they regularly suggest like could you couldn't you move this wall a little bit like that and, and this one a little bit like that what you see here are the sight lines that we um uh are discovering in in the whole setup right now and the the yeah the the way we we use them here is that we uh, use these little paper strips to be sure that we don't forget the sight line. Once you established one, you work around one, then it's important to 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 keep that in mind and to to move to the next one. And so at the end, you end up with a, a model that is cluttered with all these sight lines as a, a kind of uh, of network of interdependencies between the artworks and the architecture. And I will stop here. Thank you for your attention. Thank you. It's, it's fantastic to see the kind of range of tactics that you have to get involved in. Um, it just uh, from the from so many different kind of uh, perspectives. And I, I, I want to kind of build upon a couple of the comments and, uh, uh, and questions um, and ask a question about money. Um, and in particular about the relationship between material value, the labor required for these processes and the fact that you, I, I believe I kind of read that, that you, you only work with things that have the capacity to be 
be economically viable. Um, in other words, the what you extract has to be able to work uh, economically. It can't be simply for the you know the benefit of doing it. It has to kind of be useful. And how does that then mesh with the the degree to which so much of construction, particularly in the post-war period, is made with materials of substandard quality, you know, crappy materials, right? So can you talk a little bit about the way in which your processes uh, have to work with questions of current labor cost, the value of, and the decreased value of materials post-war, and how does how have you had to kind of navigate those two different pressures, the pressure of labor and the pressure of cheap materials? Yeah. Well, um, you know, it's it's uh, uh, you're perfectly right to point that out. It's a uh, it's a very harsh assessment that we have to make. Uh, but in order to keep, uh, let's say, the the, the operations of a, a company like Auto DC economically feasible, is that we uh, we need to make sure that uh, whatever we extract from a um, from a building is uh, is going to make money and uh, and uh, that means that in often case let's say the the range of what you're you're taking out is uh, is, is extremely reduced so it it uh, it boils down to selective dismantling uh, always um, and probably when you look at the trajectory of uh, rotor DC um, it's a a narrowing trajectory like in in the beginning and on the first projects we were extremely enthusiastic and and we just took a lot uh and many elements we realized were uh difficult to sell and um and that's a hard lesson to learn because it's uh it's it's um it's always an investment of uh, of time of uh, of work mainly of salaries you pay for the the the, the people that are um, dismantling these elements uh, it's it's an investment it's something you pay up front uh, before you even have the the let's say the perspective of having a return on that so you you have to be extremely cautious in in the, in what you take and, uh, and and that is also the reason why gradually there's natural evolution between the specialization in, in certain materials such as the uh, the ceramic um, paving elements that is something that we, we never imagined in 2014 that we would end up uh, doing uh, <laughs> like um, ceramic paving elements uh, but but uh, we know now it's something tangible we know uh, the, the value uh, at which you can resell that we know it's it's uh, extremely uh, durable material of a uh, very good quality so it's uh, that is a process you have to go through and uh, yeah I, I it's important I think to, to react to, to um, let's say uh, the comment of um, the cheapness and the worthlessness of, of uh, post-war materials. Um, many of the projects that, that I've shown are post-war, uh, like the bank building, 1971. It's post-war, but the materials in it are incredibly luxury, luxurious, and they're really made to to last. Uh, we have doorknobs uh, in in hand. Uh, molten, uh, I mean, handcrafted uh, brass and bronze that are worth uh, 1,500 euros on the second-hand market um, that are coming from that building. Um, these are ha hand knobs that that could, could last for 300 years uh, in a way. So that is, if you, if you enter a building like that with the, the let's say the mind frame that everything post war is is worthless then then you're you're missing uh, a whole lot of value now you could say okay but that was still pre um, first oil crisis and indeed when you look at what whatever it has been built after 1973 uh, there's there's definitely a quite quality gap so whatever comes after that it, it's of a slightly lesser quality but then again i guess it's it's every generation that sets it uh, its own uh distinctions between what is is worthwhile uh and what is worthless and um and that is always a, a subjective assessment 
and uh, 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 I think it's 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 important for people to uh, um, let's say to be able to grasp the fact that buildings are being demolished and you cannot throw away an entire building if you look at it as uh, something else than trash and so there is uh, uh, I think the, the, there's a um, acculturation to look at stuff like trash even when they're not uh, and uh, and I think you have to watch out for the the let's say the psychological uh, mechanisms that are at stake there and uh, and so sometimes it's 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 important to to stubbornly look at the material and and uh, like make the effort of of try to understand the qualities that are still there. Uh, <laughs> It, it it sounds a little bit uh, uh, I don't know belittling to to talk like that, but uh, often there is more than 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 what you mm. think. So so uh, you have to keep your prejudice on hold and and just make a kind of a neutral assessment. And uh, and probably uh, each period has its own trashy materials, but there are, there are always quality materials there as well. Mm. And it's just a point to identify those. You, are you optimistic in that case that you can get beyond the one percent and get? And if so, what are the levers of change that have to be set in motion to be able to do so? Well, the, the levers of change are, are definitely uh, uh, to begin with. Uh, um, I don't know if, if I have to call it a tax on carbon, uh, but but if, if in in some ways uh, the impact of emissions uh, were to be incalculated in, in the price of uh, uh, building materials, then the situation would already be completely different. Um, there's an example we often give is, is that of uh, um, the concrete pavers, uh, so paving stones in in, in concrete. Famously, today, it's cheaper to have a pallet of those stones uh, of the new pavers being delivered uh, to your front door than to have secondhand uh, pavers being delivered to your front door um, because of the cost of handling. When, when uh, It's something that is extremely easy to dismantle because they're usually laid on sand. Uh, you don't need to have to... to, to come the, there's no need to have mortar involved. So dismantling these is extremely simple. It's just one person taking them, putting them on a pallet. But simply the time of doing that is costing more money than, uh, than having them uh, shipped directly from, uh, from the, the, the factory. So uh, uh, if, if in some way, uh, let's say, the, the, um, there was a taxation on the production of new concrete to make these pavers, then that would it would be a completely different ball game. Mm. Uh, so I would see that I would see that as one of the the main levers. Um, but that was that would gradually also change the whole uh, building materials economy. Uh, if if uh, if concrete, for instance, was taxated uh, um, or taxed um, in a fair and decent way. And it would definitely privilege uh, other materials and other assembly methods and uh, yeah. But it seems like you get then into kind of complex relationships between the global market that can produce stuff much cheaply, much more cheaply than, than trying to find a way to justify the kind of expenses in the local market, right? Um, and to try to get, a, it seems like there would always be this fight between those two. Sure, sure, but uh, I mean, even if uh, even if you're not that ambitious and 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 you you forget a moment that you 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 could impose a, a like carbon taxation on, on building materials, even of the imports, um, you could encourage public authorities in their own building projects to to uh, impose on themselves a kind of artificial tax, like a kind of something that is like a mental mechanism, uh, and and added virtual costs uh, that would prevent them uh, for, of using certain materials in favor of others uh, and we believe strongly in, in the, the kind of exemplary uh, function of, of uh, uh, public commission or public commissioning in in those cases and and um, but even there it's 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 not easy because uh, money is always an issue mm -hmm. and uh, uh, so 
I think it's 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 a question of, of uh, um, forcing those commissioners to to keep up their promises that they really want to go for a, a circular economy and uh, um, for uh, yeah a, a lessened impact on the environment. You along those lines, do you see? I mean, it was interesting to hear you talk about the USA having some certain qualities of the circular economy that you look to positively. But your description also of the kind of how far you can expand is, in a sense, kind of limited by the need for this thing to be defined kind of locally, local artisan, the skills, et cetera. Is there a kind of terror? And I'm thinking mostly in terms of the US, which is incredibly large in some respects. Is there a kind of more ideal territorial limit that you see as being operative? Um, not so much in terms of a national level, but really in terms of like a distance of travel, um, kind of efficiencies along those lines. Do you see that there's a certain kind of spatial limit that is more kind of optimal? Well, that, that is difficult to say, but it, it is, uh, yeah, it's definitely the case that uh, w when you look at just uh, the the, um, the carbon impact of uh, um, the transportation of a material, then, um, I mean, the farther you go with the secondhand material, the less uh, sense it makes in, in the, having these uh, transported uh, so far away. So that is why we believe that these, uh, the, the, I mean, we we really have a, um, a need in in these uh, local networks that are very well built out and established, so that you can uh, you should be able to find your your uh, second hand paver or your second hand glue lamb beam or your second hand uh, uh, window within a range of a few uh, hundred kilometers. Mm -hmm. um, and I know that uh, it's it's I mean. It's a very different reality when we talk about uh, uh, Texas or uh, Holland or Belgium, um, and uh, in terms of the distances. And, and uh, so I I I, uh, I think there, um, uh, let's say, yeah, it, it, it would need to you would need to approach this uh, pretty differently. But uh, um, what we always found extremely interesting in the US, obviously, is uh, um, the fact that so much, uh, especially of, of domestic architecture, is, is uh, wood based, and that uh, wood is offering so much more opportunities in terms of uh, salvaging and reuse mm. uh, than the traditional. Uh, uh let's say brick buildings uh, that we have in, in the, uh, the the belgian fabric that uh, that is something that that is that has been always extremely inspiring but uh yeah it, it, as i said it it's it's understanding what is what is around you in in the uh, as an architect um not so much what is happening uh, uh, on other continents, but w w what is in, 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 uh, available in terms of uh, materials, but also in terms of skills, in terms of uh, uh, existing companies in, in the uh, radius of, uh, of 100, 200 kilometers, something like that, uh, and, and see what you can do from there. And there is always some expertise that is there and, and uh, something you, you can start from. Um, and that is really what we try to do with that Opalis project: is is uh, is stop fantasizing about how things should be when you you, you talk about uh, circular economy. I mean, what, what kind of business models there might be? Uh, but starting by looking at what what the existing circular economy operators are. So that is something that that, that is for us often a source of of very intense frustration um the the fact that you have so many startups uh that are claiming um let's say to be actors in the circular economy um and that are innovating in in ways that are uh, extremely fragile uh and that probably in in nine out of ten cases will not exist anymore in in three years while on the other hand you have many very traditional trades that are existing that are really part of the, the reuse economy in, in the sense that are or the circular economy that they're definitely uh, prolonging the, the, the lifespan of, uh, of elements and goods but that are mm, not at all claiming to be uh, the, the new um, 
the new actors of uh, or the the, the new spin-offs or, or um, startups of uh, tomorrow's circular economy. Um, I'm there are way too. I'm I'm looking at the the, the clock. I'm looking at the Q yeah, yeah. and A that coming sure. in and trying to find a kind of balance between these. Um, one question that's been been here and and it goes to this kind of question: What are the unanticipated or the complexities related to the very processes of you know demo, sort, store, repackage, transport, and release? And there's a specific question about quality control. Like, how do you how within this process, compressive strength, absorbance, how do you deal with quality control when you're, when you're kind of extracting material that you're not producing? Yeah, yeah. Well, <clears throat> I mean, uh, it, it would take me too far to, 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 uh, <laughs> to answer this exhaustively, but, but I think yeah, there are many ways in which you can tackle the, the, uh, the issue. I think it's important on, on the one hand to understand that uh, many of the, the, the requirements um, that, uh, let's say, the, the building economy is under in terms of uh, uh, being able to prove the, the quantified performance of building materials are the result of, uh, of a kind of lobby work of uh, industrial producers who knew they could deliver those numbers because they they uh, i mean it's it's part of their production procedure to do a very uh, fine-grained monitoring of, of uh, the the quantified uh, performances of their materials so so, so they have them readily available and uh, and and that is the one way in which the let, let's say the, the uh, concurrence or the competition of uh, all these small players who were part of the the, the building materials economy have been uh, has been evacuated along the years. So uh, I don't know when you look at brick brick production, for instance, in Europe, you have uh, it's you have a few monopolies like gigantic firms that are owning brick production uh, and that have total control on it. While when you look just one century back or even less, you had a fantastic uh, variety of uh, companies that were into brick production um, and I think it's important to, to realize for all partners involved in, in the, let's say in the, in the building economy that um, you, you have some perverse uh, results from that need to have all the performance quantified all the way down and uh, so but but I understand that for uh, architects it 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 doesn't shove the question completely away. Um, but there are, I would say there are ways in which you can tackle uh, the, the issue by, uh, for instance, uh, using uh, tolerance levels that are safe enough so that you're, you're not uh, reaching the, 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 the outer limits of, uh, of your, your performance. Just like in the example I gave, the fact that they used the, the, the those reclaimed bricks for a facade is is uh, exactly for those reasons. Had they been using these bricks for uh, structural masonry, it would be a, a different uh, type set of requirements. Now, on the other hand, it's important to know that when you have uh, uh, building elements that are recurring, uh, that are coming back often on the second-hand building markets, then it can be interesting to start uh, testing procedures and then you can certify the, the, the performances based on, on testing. But that, that means that you need to have a, a, a huge lots or a recurring lots of uh, those materials. So I, I, um, I, there, I, one of these things where there's so many really interesting questions and we're starting to kind of wrap up with time. Um, I think what we're going to try to do is uh, kind of uh, uh, get, give you the questions and see if there's a possibility of answering them after the lecture in another format. Um, but I want to kind of end with one um, question, um, which is really, do you see the issue of reuse potentially reinventing how build, buildings are even designed, right? In a sense, do you see the, and I, I found it very interesting that in terms of your own design, the kind of question of not making the aesthetic of reuse legible. But I'm curious also just in terms of you know, design for demolition, these kind of things that have been around for a while, what are your thoughts about what is the impact of reuse conceptually on the way in which we, we actually produce designs? 
Well, um, yeah, I think it, it's, uh, it, it, uh, I hope it will change the way in which we, we uh, consider design. I hope uh, um, uh, it will change what we consider, um, you know, in the Fountainhead, Howard Rourke is talking at some point about uh, the idea or he's saying a building has integrity. Um, I don't know if you remember that uh, that moment. Yeah, I haven't heard a reference to Howard Rourke in a while, so it's a yeah, it's, well, you know, not well, often doesn't often come up, but it's interesting. No, no, Go on. <laughs> I can imagine that it must be it's like they are the fashion, uh, but uh, no, it's it's that idea that pervaded ever since uh, the nineteen thirties. The, the idea that uh, and and I think it. it it's still dictating the way in which uh, uh, heritage, uh, architectural heritage is, is approached, is uh, a building is seen as an, a total entity in which building materials are participating in a design idea that has been conceived by an architect. Uh, um, and, um, and there is not so much of value in these components separately from, from that total design. Um, and, and I hope that, uh, the, let's say, people that are into uh, um, heritage and building preservation would start shifting their understanding of what, what heritage is also to building components. Like uh, many of the stones that are composing uh, the, the buildings in Brussels or, or, or in Copenhagen or everywhere, um, anywhere, from precious buildings or worthwhile buildings have been shaped in in craftful ways you have also uh, industrially produced materials that are uh, inventive that are uh, uh, well thought well made and that deserve in in some way at least to be recognized that they participate in in the the quality of that whole assembly that is a, a, an, an architectural masterpiece and uh, uh, so as you, you've seen, many of the buildings we are dealing with are buildings that are just on 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 the verge of becoming uh, heritage listed buildings, but then eventually end up not being it. Um, and it's it's uh, that is definitely debatable, but we, we find it troublesome that it's always hinging upon the the name of a designer. So at some point, we would like that uh, to to see the the, the whole idea of, of mobile architecture architectural heritage uh, pop up in discussions. I think that much is hinging on that. Uh, at, at, at the moment that you recognize that a cobblestone can be architectural heritage, then reintegrating a, a salvage cobblestone in, in a design uh, can be something um, that is, uh, yeah, noble or um, dignified. I don't know how to call it. Yeah. But I, I think the work is fascinating and it's really, it does change expectations about questions of value in multiple ways. And also the, the, the way in which you're working through the kind of pragmatics of how this actually gets implemented is absolutely fascinating. So thank you, Lionel. Uh, it's uh, been extraordinary having you here and present the work. And for all of those on, in the audience, uh, please join us for our next Current Works talk, uh, April 29th, 6 p.m., Emmanuel Pratt and his amazing Sweetwater Foundation, uh, moderated by Casey Jones. Uh, thank you all for joining us, and uh, uh, we'll see you soon. Thank you very much. <laughs>